Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. One thing before we start the show. I want to let you know about a special interview you'll hear at the end of this episode. It's with the host of a brand new podcast called Art Architects, the architects of art. The cool thing is this show is hosted by Director X and Taj Critchlow, two of the biggest music video directors on the planet. These guys are responsible for game-changing videos from artists like Drake and Coldplay and Kendrick Lamar and so many more. Hope you enjoyed the discussion. I sure did. That's coming up at the end of this episode. All right, let's get on with things. There is absolutely no need for music. Speaking in terms of evolution, anyway. As far as scientists can tell, there's no compelling reason for humans to make and enjoy music. Neurologically, we could get along quite well without it. Okay, sure, our world would be very dull, but we would be fine as a species. Yet, for some reason, the human brain seems to be hardwired for music. And it looks like even the non-human brain was constructed this way. Archaeologists found a flute made out of bone constructed by Neanderthals that was almost 90,000 years old. Why would they need a flute? Here are a couple of theories. Music was invented because humans, or Neanderthals, wanted to imitate birdsong. Music was invented as part of some kind of religious ritual or ceremony. Or music began as vocalizations on the way to developing spoken language. Whatever. The origins of music are a mystery. And so is much of what goes on in our brain when it comes to these sounds. Let's explore. Here are nine things about your brain and music. This is the Ongoing History of New Music, the podcast edition with Alan Cross. Check My Brain, a single from Alice in Chains in their 2009 album, Black Gives Way to Blue. And we will be checking on a lot of brains on this episode. Hello again, I'm Alan Cross, and that squishy stuff in our skulls is pretty amazing. It uses very little energy, about 330 calories a day, which is about the same as a 20-watt light bulb. Yet this thing is extremely powerful. If we had the technology to build a human brain, the resulting machine would need 10 megawatts to run. That's about the size of a small hydro dam. It can ingest about 10 megabytes of information per second. And if your brain were to be replaced by a hard drive, it would need a memory capacity of at least 2.5 petabytes. That's 2,500 terabytes or 2,560,000 gigabytes. And to finally bring this around in music, 2,560,000 gigabytes means it could store 640 million MP3s. Ish. That's about 16,000 iPod classics, which Apple doesn't make anymore, so never mind. I'm not sure why, but I'm fascinated by the relationship between music and our brains, and I want to give you a bunch of amazing facts about this relationship. So let's start with this. Deep inside our heads are three ancient parts of the brain, the amygdala, the hippocampus, and the cerebellum. These three bits are responsible for producing a hormone called dopamine. Dopamine is the body's feel-good chemical. When the body gets a shot of this chemical, its reaction is, hey, this is good. Give me more of whatever that was that made the brain produce dopamine. So we tend to seek out those stimuli and behaviors that cause them. When you have an orgasm, dopamine is produced. When you take a hit of cocaine or some other drug, dopamine is produced. And you know when you hear a great song that gives you chills and you want to dance? That's dopamine. So in other words, our brains are built to respond to sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That's amazing brain versus music fact number one. Neurologically speaking, sex and drugs and rock and roll are pretty much the same thing. Sex and drugs and rock and roll. Sex and drugs and rock and roll. Sex and drugs and rock and roll. Ian Jury and the Blockheads with Sex and Drugs and Rock and Roll, which sums up the whole idea of dopamine production in our heads. All right, amazing brain versus music fact number two also involves dopamine and music. But in this case, we're talking about the suppression of it. And it could explain why you're not getting an adequate emotional jolt from music these days. Let's talk about MP3s. 
They were designed to save space. The Fraunhofer Institute in Germany came up with the technology in the 1980s when hard drive space and bandwidth were just a fraction of what they are today. Using the well-known principles of psychoacoustics, which is the study of how we perceive sound, the Germans came up with an algorithm that could shrink a regular digital file, a WAV file, to one-tenth its size. The algorithm did this by stripping away all the audio our ears cannot hear. Now, there are layers and layers and layers of audio in each song that we hear. What's the point of having it all there if we can't hear 90% of it because it's covered up with other layers? Strip all that out, and it makes the digital file smaller. That's what happens when you rip a CD. A song that takes up 70 megabytes on the disc takes up only 7 megabytes as an MP3. Smaller files, faster transmission, quicker downloads, less bandwidth, and less space taken up on hard drives. It works brilliantly, and MP3 compression technology has revolutionized the music world. However, there could be a problem, and we don't even have to get into the debate as to whether people can tell the difference between an MP3, a CD, or a vinyl version of the same song. The problem is that MP3s might not feel as good as those other formats. You see, when you hear a song that's been encoded as an MP3, your ear may be fooled, but not your brain. It apparently knows that the algorithm has done its psychoacoustical magic and spends a couple of milliseconds searching for that stripped out musical material it thinks it should be there. This delays the processing of the music ever so slightly. And because of this delay, the brain does not secrete as much dopamine as it would listening to an uncompressed piece of audio. Not as much dopamine means not as much of a pleasure shot to the body. If this theory is correct, the biggest dopamine boost comes from listening to pure analog sound, a live performance, for example. That's followed by vinyl, then CD, then MP3. And the more you degrade MP3s, using bad earbuds, settling for the sound out of laptop speakers, the less of a dopamine hit you get, and the less you get off on the music. So in other words, MP3s cheat you out of getting the maximum emotional impact of music. Let's move to amazing brain versus music fact number three. Music can work better than drugs for some things. As the brain operates, its activity can be observed as neural oscillations, electrical impulses given off by our own personal force, for lack of a better description. And most people call these oscillations brain waves. There were delta waves, theta waves, alpha waves, and beta waves. They're all at different frequencies and are produced when we're doing different things, sleeping, dreaming, trying to visualize something, or just going about our business. These waves operate at very low frequencies, but scientists have discovered that if they transpose these waves up to frequencies we can hear, the frequencies of music, they can be used for all sorts of interesting things. For example, Katinka Klan is a classically trained cellist. She's figured out a way to duet with her brain. What she does is she straps an EEG receptor to her head, which transforms beta waves from her neural oscillations into audible sound, which she then plays along to. Listen. Okay, so that's not going to top too many charts, but it's still, you know, kind of cool. And this sort of technology has a more practical use. Doctors have found that brainwave music is good for treating everything from insomnia to anxiety to depression. Patients have their brainwaves recorded, which are then fed back into their ears. And this seems to have the effect of rebooting the brain chemically in the way that helps treat these disorders. So to put it another way, the music of your own brain can be used to treat certain neurological and psychological conditions. And finally, there's this. In 2005, little Corey George of a small town in South Wales celebrated his ninth birthday. Among his presents was a little cash, and he asked his mom, Tina, if he could go to the shop across the street to buy some candy. On his way over, he was struck by an SUV and suffered very bad head injuries. 
He lay unconscious for two weeks on life support, totally unresponsive. Then his mom came up with the idea of playing his favorite album while he lay in his hospital bed. Less than an hour after putting on this album, Corey opened his eyes and started moving his fingers and toes. And four days later, he was moved out of intensive care. I've never been able to find out where Corey George is today, but here's hoping he's all right. Oh, and here's a track from his favorite album. Green Day and Wake Me When September Ends, a song that helped awaken a nine-year-old coma patient back in 2005. And this isn't an isolated example either. A quick internet search will turn up stories of songs by Adele, James Blunt, Brian Adams, Bon Jovi, and the Rolling Stones all having something to do with people coming out of comas. And there's probably more. Coming up, the weird interplay between music and memory. This episode is called Amazing Things About Your Brain and Music. And here's our next fact. Our musical memories live in their own part of the brain, separate from all the other memories. And let me show you what I mean. In 2005, a professional classical musician came down with a severe case of meningitis. The infection destroyed parts of his brain, leaving the 71-year-old man with a terrible case of retrograde amnesia. His entire life had been erased. To make matters even worse, he lost the ability to make new memories. So this man existed in an eternal present. Okay, well, not all his memories were destroyed. He was still able to play music. Complicated pieces he learned decades back. He was able to sight-read new music, and he had the capacity to memorize that new music. What this says is that our music memories are separate and isolated from our day-to-day -day memories and all the events and people and experiences from our lives. Another example. Doctors found an aneurysm the size of a golf ball in the skull of an Ottawa woman named Alison Woyawoda. She's a lifelong musician and performer. After the surgery, as is sometimes the case with these tremendously complex operations, Alison awoke to find that she had lost the ability to speak. She couldn't concentrate. She couldn't read. She couldn't write. However, the moment she was wheeled up to a piano, she could play. Neurologists know that speech and music are somehow closely related because of their common need for melody, tonality, rhythm, and tempo. Allison's music therapist could see that something was locked inside her brain. Could music be used to bring it out? By associating musical phrases with spoken word phrases, Allison learned to talk again. Her ability to speak was reconstructed using a foundation of music. Today, she can speak, perform music, and sing in three different languages. It was really hard, but it all worked. And here's one more example. My grandfather lived to the age of 102, and for the last two years of his life, he was plagued by a series of mini strokes, which led to both dementia and an inability to speak. He often didn't even know when people walked into his room, let alone recognize them. He was that out of it. However, he had a little radio by his bed, and when one of his favorite songs from when he was young came on, he'd start to hum and even sing. It was a remarkable thing to see. So how is all of this possible? It can only be because music memories and regular memories live in different places in our heads. Our next Amazing Brains versus Music fact is related to this idea of music memories being different from regular ones. Now, you would think that when you hear a song, that song would be stored intact in one place in your head. Well, no, it's actually deconstructed and stored in at least two different spots. After music enters your ear, it's transferred to the auditory cortex, the part of the brain responsible for processing sound. Music, lyrics, everything is all protest in one big chunk by the auditory cortex. But then the signal enters an area of the brain called the mid-superior temporal sulcus. Its job is to split the song into music and into lyrics. Once that split happens, the music enters an area called the anterior superior sulcus, and the lyrics are steered into a completely different part of the brain. This is because the brain's speech centers need to kick in. And it gets complex. 
We have to recognize the words, determine what they mean, and in the context in which they're being used. So basically, Listen to Music creates two databases in our head, a musical one and one for lyrics. This could explain why most of us pay more attention to the music part of a song than the lyrics. Processing the lyrics takes more time, and depending on the song, we just might not be up to it. You've experienced this, and you probably didn't even know it. Think about the times you've been asked what the words are to a particular song, and the only way you manage to remember them is by singing the song. And it works the other way, too. If you can't recall a song, maybe someone prompts you by giving you the first few words, and then the whole thing comes flooding back. Okay, how about this for our next amazing fact about your brain and music? You're listening to a song, and it suddenly cuts out. What happens? Well, the song keeps going on in your head for a few seconds because the brain automatically tries to fill in the sudden silence with what it has stored in its musical database. And I know this has happened to you. A song somehow gets stuck in your head. A snippet of the track gets caught in a loop, and it drives you insane because it won't stop. Almost 100% of the population experiences this at some point. There are many names for this neurological phenomenon. Musical imagery repetition, involuntary musical imagery, non palinacusis auditory hallucinations, stuck song syndrome. But the most common phrase seems to be earworm. A couple of things about earworms. If you're a woman, chances are they last longer for you and are more irritating than what guys experience. More than three quarters of all earworms involve music with lyrics. People don't tend to get just purely instrumental earworms. It does happen, but it's just not all that common. If you have OCD, you are more susceptible to earworms. We don't know why. And most of these earworm loops are no longer than 30 seconds. Why? Well, because that's about the buffer size of the RAM in your auditory cortex. For some people, earworms are debilitating. They're a serious handicap. They can persist for days, weeks, months, years, and they can be very loud and very distracting. For those people, only strong OCD medication seems to work. But what about everybody else? Oddly enough, the best cure for an earworm seems to be to do a Sudoku. The kind of brain processing required to do one of those puzzles seems to be quite effective at flushing out the audio cache of your auditory cortex and thus squishing the earworm. It's happened to me. I've tried it. seems to work. Or I may be just imagining things. Either way, a couple of Sudokos have kept me from going crazy. Cypress Hill, going insane. Something you might experience when a song gets stuck in your head. More amazing facts about your brain and music in just a sec. We're looking at the strange and cool relationships our brains have with music, and frankly, we still don't understand a lot of this stuff. Take the case of how music can help with brain surgery. This is really, really cool. When something physical goes wrong in your skull, sometimes the only treatment is to go in there and fix it. But anytime you start rooting around with all that goop in your skull, you're asking for trouble. While neurologists have made great progress in mapping the brain and what parts are in charge of what functions, everybody is just a little bit different. You can't just go in there and start moving stuff around blindly. You need to know what's going on in each millimeter of gray matter. And this is where music comes in. For certain procedures, patients are awoken from the general anesthetic and given their favorite musical instrument. As the surgeons dig around, the patient is asked to play and play and play. If the surgeons poke something in the patient's brain that affects their playing, they know they're in the wrong spot and need to find another solution, another route. Which brings me to Brad Carter. Brad had become unable to play the guitar because of severe tremors in his hands due to Parkinson's disease. But if you Google his name now, you'll be led to a bunch of sites that show video of him shredding on a guitar while surgeons put some deep brain stimulation electrodes in his head. His skull is screwed into a frame to keep his head still. Otherwise, though, he's wide awake and free to rock out and sing, which is exactly what the surgeons needed him to do. This was the only possible treatment and the only way the surgeons could conduct the surgery. And it worked great. 
So there's another amazing brain versus music fact. Music can assist with brain surgery. Which brings me to this Metallica song called Crash Course in Brain Surgery. Metallica and Crash Course in Brain Surgery, which is kind of what we just had. One more amazing fact about our brains and music. Not everyone experiences music in exactly the same way. I want you to think about that for a second. How do you know what you're hearing is what I hear or what the next person hears? You don't. For example, there's a neurological disorder called amusia, which seems to lie in a brain defect when it comes to processing pitch as well as the centers of the brain that deal with music recognition and music memory. Problems may also result with sensing changes in timbre, rhythm, and tempo. Depending on the person, this could be congenital, or it could have resulted from some kind of brain injury. Whatever, up to 4% of humans have this issue. So what is it? Well, basically, amusia is an inability to hear music as pleasurable sound. A person with amusia perceives music to be just noise, awful noise, and it stresses them out just as bad as fingernails down a chalkboard. They can't tell a major chord from someone just smashing all the keys on a piano. They have no concept of a guitar being out of tune. They can't hum a song, let alone sing. Melody means nothing to them. Musical scales? What are those? It's almost like a musical form of dyslexia. Amusia is pretty hard to diagnose. After all, who takes their kid to the doctor because he or she doesn't seem to like music? Where it does have a bigger impact is when speaking a tonal language like Chinese. Because the pitch of a single syllable can change the meaning of a word in a tonal language, people with amusia might have a hard time understanding or speaking such a language. At the other end of the spectrum is synesthesia. This is a condition where the senses kind of overlap. There are many different kinds of synesthesia. For example, I met a woman for whom numbers are also perceived as having specific colors associated with them. But the synesthesia I want to talk about is the musical version. This is where notes, chords, and other combinations of musical sounds take on colors. Kanye West has this. So does Stevie Wonder, even though he's totally blind. Tori Amos, Billy Joel, Patrick Stump of Fall Out Boy, Eddie Van Halen, Pharrell Williams, they all say that they have music or sound to color synthesia. Growing up, they thought what they experienced is what everybody else experienced. Nope, they are special. And they find it hard to tell non-synesthetes exactly how things are for them. Here's a guy who sees colors when he hears music. Sam Endicott started out as the singer of The Bravery, but he's also written songs for other people, including Shakira and Christina Aguilera. It's a pretty big swing in genres. Could it be that his synesthesia helps him? Maybe, probably. So there are a bunch of things about your brain and music that may have blown your mind to some degree or another, ranging from brain chemistry to the ways different brains are wired in different ways. If I can help you with anything else, swing over to my website called a journal of musical things.com. I update this thing every single day with music news and music recommendations and all manner of audio and video. There's even a free newsletter that comes out every weekday. You should sign up for that. Seriously. I'm on Twitter a lot. There's Facebook and Google plus and Instagram too. Just search for me and you'll find me. And I spend a lot of time answering emails. Use alan at alancross.ca if you want a piece of that. Technical Productions by Rob Johnston. I'm Alan Cross. You've been listening to the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and everywhere you find your favorite podcasts. Before we leave today's ongoing history of new music podcast, uh, I want you to know that we're part of a network called Curious Cast. And Curious Cast has a lot of podcasts available on its network. And one of the new ones is called Art Cotex. And I have two of the hosts of Art Cotex with me here. Uh, we have Taj Krishlo and Director X. And we want to give you a bit of a, an introduction to what this new podcast is all about. So, who wants to go first? And explain exactly what you guys will be doing. And obviously, here's a hint. If you're at the end of this podcast, my podcast, Chance Start has something to do with music. 
So our show is pretty much about, it's in the world of music. It's pretty much us sitting down with uh, storytellers that come from music videos. Uh, I feel like we live in a world where we don't give these, these amazing creative uh, artists uh, the flowers they deserve. They create some of the most uh, impactful uh, content on the planet that gets a lot of eyeballs on it. And coming from the world of music video, being in the business for over 20 years, we felt it was necessary to create a show like Architects to sit down and hear their stories, their come ups, their journey, their process of creating some of the most iconic music videos, films, and content on the planet. Now, you guys have been deeply involved in this world for, like you say, a long time. Who have you worked with? I've directed videos for Alicia Keys, Puff Daddy, Cisco, uh, uh, Destiny's Child, Drake, Justin Bieber, Two Chains, Rosalia, Iggy Azalea, Sean Paul, Beanie Man, um, Ariana Grande. Uh, well, you know. Okay, uh, now, now now you're just bragging. Corn, <laughs> <laughs> John Mayer, the list goes on. Like we, this has literally been. Um, a crazy journey and and i would say x is the goat because as long as he's been doing it like like late 90s to now it's still relevant you know like we broke our our production company fella with uh this music video for uh for dj khaled drake and bieber called pop star so it's 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 been a crazy journey and um there were two kids from brampton ontario that uh went out to you know make art that broke out to the world and now we're using our podcast as another form of storytelling, but through an audio uh, medium. Okay. How are you going to make that transition? You've been telling stories through video. Now it's going to be only audio. So uh, you're going to have to change your style a little bit, I guess. I mean, we're talking to the creator, so it's a different kind of thing. You know what I mean? Um, the, the story is the story of the maker. So it's not conceptualizing music and visuals to it. It's talking like the last, the first podcast, the debut of our, of the show was with Dave Myers. Um, another guy that's been in the game for a long, long time. And just talking about that, the philosophy behind his approach to art, the work he's done. And, you know, as well, digging into some of the larger world issues out there. Like we have a whole talk about black lives matter. Uh, on that podcast and being a white director and his perspective coming up in a black music, uh, world. So it's just a, it's a little different than what we're used to doing. Without any spoilers, give me the kind of stories that you'll be telling. Give me an example of a story. I guess the examples is pretty much their come up. Um, what they, what gravity, what, what drew them in to get into this world of, uh, filmmaking, um, their influences, um, their highs, their lows, and pretty much their breakthrough moment. And, and a lot of times to your point, um, Alan, like when you watch a music video, you're just seeing the end result, but you don't see what, what went into to make that product. And, and that, that piece of art as far as the storyboards and the, the art direction and sitting down with your head department and the collaboration. So it's pretty much we're, we're, we're giving them that kind of, you know, close set behind experience where you get to see the process of how uh, we get to the finish line. Right. Because I've, I've always, I've often watched music videos and wondered where the hell did this come from? What kind <laughs> of headspace do you have to be in to come up with these images, these storylines, these, you know, things. Uh, and, and I have no idea. Yeah, it's, it's, and that's the point of the show. Like, look, we're probably like around the same age. Like I came up, I came up in the eighties era where that's what made me fall in love with music videos, right? The MTV much music era, watching videos by like Madonna and Peter Gabriel and like Phil Collins and, and Michael Jackson and, uh, uh, and Aerosmith. And I was always fascinated by music videos and the storytelling and the dancing and the style and all that stuff. And that's what got, that's what made us fall in love with the art. So imagine if you could go back in the days and sit down with Duran Duran and talk about the Hungry Like a Wolf video, like what the hell compelled you guys to be in this jungle and, and 
and just going through this crazy, crazy story and sitting down with like the best of the best and hearing their, the stories of the directors working with Madonna and working with the stones. And that's the beauty about the show. It's like, we get that access to these filmmakers, to these artists. I've worked with the biggest and brightest artists in the entertainment business, but learn about that journey, that creative journey, that collaboration to make the work that we see that's now on television or on YouTube. And, and before we jump, I just want to say, please follow us at architects pods. Uh, I can't wait for this. Sounds like a great series. Looking forward to it. It's called Art Catex with Karina Evans, Tash Critchlow, and Director X. And uh, I can't wait to hear some of these stories. Thank you so much, you guys. All right.